The Western Caucus has long been pushing legislation and regulatory improvements to modernize the permitting process in order to ensure affordable and reliable American energy from all sources and secure our strategic mineral supplies. This is an important economic security issue, an important environmental security issue, as well as a national security issue. Today, we'll hear about perm permitting and regulatory challenges, as well as suggestions to expedite and improve permitting modernization to help America build infrastructure, sustain affordable and reliable energy, and improve our domestic production and supplies of strategic minerals. Uh, I'd like to welcome and just in introduce our guest panelists first, and then we'll go to our, our members for an opening statement. Uh, today, we have Andrew Wheeler, the former administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as Kate McGregor, the former deputy secretary for the Department of the Interior. So thank you for joining us both. And I'll start off and turn it over to Congressman Garrett Graves of Louisiana for an opening statement. So sorry. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, good afternoon, and it's, uh, it's great to join you. Appreciate appreciate you all being here. Um, look, um, as, as we move forward and address, I think, an underinvestment in infrastructure that we've had for decades, and that means infrastructure writ large, everything from roads and bridges to resiliency infrastructure to certainly infrastructure in the energy space, we've got to have a regulatory environment that's compatible with the urgency that we're facing. And um, as you may recall, uh, Secretary Chow, uh, former Trans Department of Transportation Secretary, used to talk about the fact that the average road project takes seven years and three months to go through an environmental review. And I'll say it again, seven years and three months. I've been doing infrastructure most of my life, and I uh, can't think of a single road project I've been involved in that's take that, taken that long to build. Um, and, and, and that's just one very small example of the challenges that are before us. Uh, Princeton estimates that you you may have to uh, double or triple the electricity infrastructure in, in order to meet the growing demand in, in energy. Um, the pipeline infrastructure that we need is off the charts. And so I'm going to say this once again, and actually, let me, let me bring up a, a third one from home. Um, resiliency. Um, I live in South Louisiana, and, and our need for resiliency-type infrastructure, everything from restoring our coast to building levees. It, it is absolutely urgent. And, and we've got to have a regulatory environment that's compatible with the urgency. Um, uh, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but what the heck. Um, Mitch Landry, who was the infrastructure czar for the, for the uh, Biden administration, we spoke before he, he took the job. And he was asking me what I thought. And, and you know, went through one thing, and I said, I got two things for you. Now, one thing I won't bore you with, but the second one, I said, I said, your problem is that this administration's regulatory agenda is entirely incompatible with your infrastructure agenda, meaning you're continuing to add new hurdles and hoops to your regulatory agenda. It's going to impede or prevent you from being able to implement your infrastructure agenda. And I said, you're, you, you have a great portfolio under this job, but you're actually going to become a liability to the administration because you're not going to be able to build things. And, and, and I don't know what the number is today, but Brookings looked uh, in, in, I think it was November of last year, and found that I think 80% of the, of, uh, no, let me see if I remember this right. We had been through 80% of the life of the of the IIJA, the infrastructure bill, um, but there was only like 20% of the grants had actually been issued. And, and, and just giving some indication of how arduous this regulatory process is. So look, I'll just end with saying that, um, that, that I do think in June of last year, we made some progress, some progress with the Fiscal Responsibility Act and some of the major NEPA reforms that we were able to include in that negotiation. Uh, NEPA has not been really touched uh, since uh, since it was originally drafted with the exception from very some very technical corrections, technical changes. And uh, we did make some massive, massive changes to that law. There more needs to be done, but uh, but really looking forward to, to building upon that success and in that regard, the administration today released 489 pages of rules to implement uh, some of those changes. We haven't had a chance to digest that yet, and we're looking forward to doing that. Well, thanks, Congressman. And we're now joined by Congresswoman Harriet Hagman of Wyoming. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I was just at a hearing down the hallway, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this incredibly important issue. The Biden administration has issued the fewest acres of oil and gas leases to any president since World War II and has slow rolled the permitting. Part of the drilling permit process when it comes to oil and gas development on public lands is the environmental assessments or the environmental impact statements required by NEPA. 
For onshore production, you need right of way permits to build roads to the drill site. There are all kinds of permits needed from various agencies and parties that any project needs to obtain before any work can even be started. In addition to the time consuming nature of this process, each permit that is required is a chance for a radical environmental group uh, to litigate and engage in lawfare. To highlight this, just today, the White House Council on uh, Environmental Quality issued a new final NEPA rule that will further complicate the NEPA process, increase lawsuits, and needlessly delay future projects. One solution is incorporated in the Builder Act, and the concept, uh, which is the concept of reasonable foreseeability. Through the Builder Act, language was inserted that amends NEPA requirements for detailed statements on federal actions affecting the environment and narrowing agency considerations to address envir environmental effects that are reasonably foreseeable. The bill also adds language narrowing the re review of alternatives to the proposed action to, the, to those that are technically and economically feasible and fit the purpose and need of the project clarifying that these should include a reasonable range of alternatives to the proposed action, including an analysis of any negative environmental impacts of not, implement, of not implementing the proposed agency action. The bill also adds language requiring the use of scientific integri integrity and reliable data to implement NEPA. In addition to that language, modifying existing NEPA statute, the bill clarifies that an agency shall issue an EIS for actions that have a reasonably foreseeable significant effect on the quality of the human environment and shall prepare a concise EA for actions that do not have such reasonably foreseeable significant effects or the effects are unknown unless the action is covered by a categorical exclusion. Coming from the state of Wyoming, I can tell you that we are, uh, I feel that we are the number one target for this administration in terms of their efforts to shut down our coal industry, our oil and gas industry, our access to federal lands, and pretty much everything that uh, that runs the runs Wyoming. I look forward to having an engaging discussion, answering questions. It is frustrating when you work with regulators though, and when you work with an administration that has such limited knowledge of the real world impacts of what they do. Uh, everything that this administration has done will make our lives worse, not better. It's part of why I introduced the Energy Poverty Prevention and Accountability Act, trying to force this administration and future, future administrations to actually disclose the real cost of the regulations and the decisions that they make that affect our ability to access and develop affordable and reliable energy. Thank you. Terrific, thanks, Carson. We've been joined by Congressman Buddy Carter from Georgia. We'll slide in here. Thank you. And for his uh, open comment. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I apologize for my tardiness, um, and, but I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to present here and and to discuss what I think is one of the most pressing issues that we have in our federal government, and that's permitting. Look, I'm not trying to mix apples and oranges, but I, I will tell you, I want to give you an example, an example of um, what I would consider to be a disaster in permitting. I represent the entire coast of Georgia, including two major seaports, the Port of Savannah and the Port of Brunswick. The Port of Savannah, in March of 2022, we finished the deepening of, that, of the Savannah Harbor. We went from 42-foot depth to 47-foot depth. That was a major economic development project for our area and for the United States. We finished it in March of 2022. The permitting for that project started in 1996. In 1996. I mean, I, 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 again, I don't think it's apples and oranges. I think it's an example of a broken system and a system that needs to that needs to be reformed. And that's why I'm I'm glad that that we are paying close attention to that. And I'm glad that it's um something that that hopefully we'll be doing. I have the honor and privilege of um, of serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee and specifically as chair of the Environment, Manufacturing and Critical Materials Subcommittee. And that's something that um, I take very seriously, obviously representing the entire coast of Georgia and environment's important to me. It's my home, it's where I've lived all my life, where I intend to live the rest of my life. Some of my fondest memories growing up are going fishing with my dad. I wanna make sure that my children, my grandchildren, 
have some of those same memories, and it's important to me to protect our environment. I will tell you that some of my goals, some of my priorities as chair of the uh, subcommittee on environment and manufacturing and critical materials is, first of all, to beat China. We know that critical materials right now, China is the OPEC of critical materials and critical minerals in particular. All of us recognize that, and all of us recognize that we have got to we, we've got to start mining and processing critical minerals here and with our allies. That's extremely important. I also want to make sure that we're um, unleashing American energy. All of you know what has happened during this Biden administration that they day one, the Biden administration, when they were in office, declared war on American energy, particularly on fossil fuels and the oil and gas industry. And that, you know, look, I believe in climate change. I believe climate change is real. I believe that it's cyclical, and I, I'm not one of those who subscribes to the theory that if we don't have it resolved by day after tomorrow, we're all going to fry. But at the same time, I do believe it is real. A man has an impact on it, and that we can, that that we should pay close attention to it. I believe in all of the above type energy strategy. I believe that we've got to address this in in a way that's not going to bankrupt our economy, and that's certainly important. I also want to make sure we're reducing emissions. All of us, when we talk about when we talk about climate change, when we talk about emissions, we understand it's a global problem. We understand that even if we were to go to net zero here in America, unless we have other countries doing their part, it's not going to work. Unless China can and, and the third part, the third country, third world countries developing with third world countries, unless they do their part, this is not going to do us any good. We are the leading innovators in the world. I believe that. I believe the greatest innovators, the greatest scientists are right here in the United States of America. And yes, we should be encouraging innovation. And yes, we should be exporting that innovation. I do believe that. Another thing is that um, we should be creating, and one of the goals that I have for the subcommittee is to create a, a pro-growth business environment like we have in the state of Georgia. For 11 years in a row, we've been the number one state in the in, in the nation to do business in. And there's a reason for that. One of the reasons is because of our pro-growth environment. Another is that we have affordable, reliable energy available. And that's very important as well. And then um, you know, I, I want to make sure that that we um that that we continue to to address the the issues surrounding our environment, as I say, and reducing emissions, that's extremely important. I look forward to the discussion today. I, I appreciate the, again, the emphasis that we're putting on permitting. One last point before I yield, and that is, you know, last year I had the opportunity to go to Houston, Texas three times. Every time I was there, it was the same thing. Permitting regulations are crushing us. And no matter what sector of our economy you go through, whether it be energy, healthcare, manufacturing, it's the same story. Man permitting, regulations. Right now, the EPA, this has passed 140, 140 rules, 140 rules that we are looking at in the Energy and Commerce Committee. You know, we, we've got Congressional Review Acts on a lot of them, and then others where we're, we're just calling them in and talking to them about them. It, it, there is such a thing as overregulation, and I think we're experiencing it now. Again, thank you for having me here today, and I'll yield back. Thanks, Congressman. I uh, have to introduce our guest speakers now. Uh, first, Andrew Wheeler. As EPA Administrator and Deputy Administrator, Andrew led the 14,000-member agency and oversaw a $9 billion budget and led all aspects of setting and implementing the national environmental agenda. For almost 15 years, he held significant leadership roles in the United States Senate committees, including as staff director and chief counsel for both for the Senate, uh, Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Most recently, Andrew established the first Office of Regulatory Management for the Commonwealth of Virginia and served as the Acting Secretary of Nat Natural History and Resources. And with that, Andrew. Thank you. Sasan, and uh, say thank you to all three members of Congress that are here. Appreciate the invitation to speak to you all today. Uh, the, the two words, and I'm going to keep coming back to this over and over again, the two words that I think are the most important for any permitting system are transparency and certainty. 
You have to have transparency in the process. People have to understand what is required in a permitting process, and they have to know where their permit stands in the process itself. And the second is certainty. You have to have certainty in how long the process will take. I am not suggesting, nor have I ever suggested, that a permit has to be approved in a certain amount of time. What I've always said and still say is that a, a permit has to have a decision within a certain amount of time. And that decision could be a denial, but it is unfair to the permittee and to the community if a permit can go on for years and years without a decision. During the Trump administration at EPA, we implemented something called the lean management system, also called the Toyota system. By the time we left office, we had trained over 80% of the EPA workforce. And we used the, the lean management system to speed up our permitting process, our inspection process, every, everything within the agency that you can measure, we put through a lean management process, including the state implementation plans, the SIP plans under the Clean Air Act. And what we found is when you when you use a system such as blame management where you're putting transparency in place, it speeds up the process. Um, I visited our regional office in Atlanta, and they were working on a huge, we heard a huge backlog of state implementation plan applications for the states um, from the Obama administration. I visited our, our office in Atlanta, Georgia, and they were working to work through the backlog um, they tracked every single implementation plan on a huge board with something as simple as yellow sticky pads. One, one little yellow sticky note where, um, represented each implementation plan. And you had zero to 15 days, 15 to 30 days, and you could chart them across the board. And if, it, and if any of them became late, it went to the bottom of the board and it changed color. What we discovered was we had some EPA employees that were doing an incredible job and had been doing an incredible job and were meeting all of their deadlines. We had other employees that weren't. When you shine light on the system, those employees that um, were taking longer to process speeded up the processing time. We, uh, it's, a, it's amazing what peer pressure will do without having management to step in and direct, um, you know, you're late or you need to work harder. It, it was a real motivator, and we really did see results at the regional levels on processing permits and, and so forth. The Trump administration also, for the first time in 50 years, uh, updated the NEPA regulations. And this is something, and I'm, and I'm glad Congress took a look at NEPA last year. Uh, this is something over 50 years in the making. Whenever we tried to reform uh, NEPA, when I worked in the Senate, we always heard from the other side, Oh, that's a you know that's the third rail. That's the holy grail. You can't amend the statute. Uh, NEPA, which is an incredible groundbreaking statute worldwide. Other countries look at what we do with both NEPA and all of our environmental statutes. But NEPA had become a social welfare program for lawyers. It was no longer really serving the purpose that it was intended uh, and intended to provide. One of the main um, reforms in our NEPA regulation was saying that. Permitting decisions had to be made within two years. Well, what we did in the NEPA regs was we put a lot of things in the NEPA regs that had already been worked out in Congress for the highway program. And Representative Graves remembers this from the safety loo discussions and the previous highway bills that he and I worked on for a number of years when he was when he was a staffer going back to the to the 90s. Um, we were allowed to do that for highway projects, but the other side did not want us to touch NEPA for everything. And you have to, it's only fair to reform NEPA for all types of projects that, we, that need federal permits. So we did, those are two really big important reforms. Unfortunately, the Biden administration overturned our NEPA uh, progress. Uh, and I, I point out one, one more thing on the NEPA side and the, the, the importance of the two years. The Empire State Building was designed, permitted, and built within two years. I honestly believe that we should be able to review any permit within a two-year period of time. Now, the last two years, I've been with Governor Yonkin in Virginia, and he's very big on transparency and certainty. And we implemented a new process in Virginia for permitting, which is our permits.virginia.gov. And I have a handout, and it's on the table in front of you. It's, it's been passed around. What we did is we created a tracking dashboard system for all permits in Virginia. 
We started with three agencies, and you can go on. It's a live website. You can go on it today again, permits.virginia, spelled out, dot gov. And you can track any permit from our Department of Environmental Quality, Marine Resources, or Energy Department. Um, the state is planning on adding three more agencies this summer. They will add um, Department of Transportation, the Health Department, and Department of Conservation and Recreation. If you look on the second page, it shows I pulled up just a random permit. This is the permit with the, the information at the top of the permit T. The third page is the application process timeline. And it shows you two sets of bar graphs. The gray bars are the, the estimated time for each stage of a permit review. And the blue bar is the actual time each stage takes. And if you see on here for this select permit, you have an original target date of March 1st, 2024. The staff review of this permit has already gone past that. So you see a new revised target date of um, August 8th, 2024. If you notice the red line, which is the original target, never goes away. So you know that this permit is late, um, but you know where it's late and what the holdup is. A lot of the permits, I, I will say this, because we all contract the permits that we send up to the Army Corps of Engineers or EPA. A lot of the delays are when it's at US Army Corps of Engineers for the EPA. But you can go on here and you can see each step of the process, how long each step takes, and how long it's supposed to take, and how long it really takes. The last page is the bar graph in, um, in verbiage, where you can see on the far right the completed steps, the steps that are in progress, and the steps that haven't started yet. This is transparency, and this provides certainty. And I hope any reforms going forward takes a look at those two important key concepts. We need to provide more transparency in the permitting process, and that can be legislated, and it can be done by administrative reform. And we need to have more certainty. My final note on this, my personal opinion on why we don't have nuclear plants being built is because of the certainty of the permitting process at the NRC as well as the waste disposal. But the biggest thing has been the certainty because if you if you take out a loan to build something and you think it's only going to take you four years and it ends up taking you six or eight years, that's the loan. Those are loans that you're having to pay off before you get that facility built and up and running. And it's it's just you cannot operate a business in this country under those circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm happy to welcome Kate McGregor here. Um, she spent a fair bit of time here before. Uh, she's currently serves as the Vice President of Environmental Services for Next Era Energy, ensuring thoughtful environmental planning and compliance from project development to operations. Before joining Next Era Energy, Kate served as the Senate confirmed Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, where her work included overseeing responsible domestic energy and mineral development implementation of the Great American Outdoors Act to enhance our national parks, and other interior-focused priorities. Kate also served as the Interior's Regulatory Reform Officer, charged with improving the Interior's review and promulgation of regulations, as well as identifying regulations for repeal, replacement, and or modification. Before that, Kate uh, joined the Department of Interior uh, after working on Capitol Hill for 10 years. So welcome back to the Hill. Thanks, I have a little PTSD. <laughs> I don't have prepared remarks, which I'm sure everyone's really happy about. But um, first, I want to do the thing to Western Caucus. You guys have been one of the most effective <laughs> voting blocks, I think, in the Congress for a really long time. And as a former resources staffer, getting to 218 on some of our measures is never easy, but getting in the caucus that you're kind of like really put wind on your back and uh, putting positions on the floor. I also wanted to just share like one of my first visits when I started at Interior. I spent time in Wyoming before, but um, one of my first trips at Interior is, you know, whatever, and acting was um, out to my own name to do some cool stuff. And there was a giant um, poster on the side of the giant warehouse that said, as regulations grow, freedom dies. And that's always stayed with me. I thought I thought it was awesome. Also, there's like a big red, red white, blue eagle. So it's like, it's beautiful. But um, it really sort of summed up in my mind what we came in to do in the last administration. And, and I think Congressman Graves might remember this because I sat in the desk through those doors and um, never anticipated that I would be at Interior, let alone the position I left in. But I do remember sitting, looking out the window, thinking, oh my gosh, 
the amount of regulations that have been promulgated in the eighth year of the last of the Obama administration was just flooding the zone. And and I think we were like, how are we going to be able to do a lot of this? I think OIRA came up to spend some quality time with us on the well control rule or a couple other things, but um what a turn of events an election makes. And I would just say, um, aside from that, what we were able to do in the last administration, if you ever were to look at the reg agenda or reg info or the calculations by which uh, the government chooses to evaluate a deregulatory action, you would notice that for the first time in history under President Trump, it went negative and it stayed negative for four years. And not to brag, Interior was, I think, the lead agency in the one in the top three in year two. We would stay in the top three for the rest, but- We were one overall. Okay. <laughs> we'll let the record go check that. But, <laughs> but um, I think all of us in the administration came in with a mind towards action, a bias towards action and deregulation. and not just removal, but what is the smartest way to allow for measured um, development to continue in this country? And to your point, for, for companies that want to function and build in America to have certainty. And I think that continues the role I play now in the private sector. It's something that we think a lot about when it comes to any energy infrastructure, and we have it all um, in this country. What what are we doing? How? What smart and reasonable measures can be codified in such a way that we have certainty and path forward? And and um, I think it changes. And I want to just quick touch on too. It's not just regulations. Having um, managerial uh, managerial focus at an agency can make all the difference. Um, and I think one of the examples I would say is the BLM APDs. We started with an APD count um, and an average time frame to process a uh, oil and gas APD on this committee. And uh, in a hearing I had, I got the information. It was over 380, 385 days on average for one APD. The statute actually does tell them to do it in 30 days. And, um, you know, there's a whole lot of, we can't go any faster. We have X, Y, and Z that we have to do before, including NEPA and multiple other checks, IMs. Um, different measures that we have to review prior to issuance. And I think we changed that. And within two years, we got it down to, I believe, 91 days on average and we kept it there. And we were chugging pretty quickly. And when I say quickly, it doesn't mean we're evading environmental review. It was more so, how do we do our job more efficiently with the tools we have? Because you can. Um, but I don't want to discount the fact that this um, it did take the house to get me for one of them. Um, but I would say that um, the measures that come out of Congress matter. And the focus that Western Caucus and this committee has had on birthday reform is refreshing. It is needed. Um, it is making a difference. Um, just oversight makes a difference, I think. And um, I, I thank you for your work on that because it matters um, for every single aspect of life, for any of the agencies that govern um, humans doing things in America. And I'll just end with these questions. Thank you. I will uh, turn it over to the members for questions and comments, and we'll, we'll start off with Congresswoman Hagman. <laughs> There's a couple of comments that I that I would make. I agree with the what what you said. The projects have to have transparency and certainty. Most regulators are risk adverse. They don't like transparency, and the only certainty is in protecting their own job. And that's why you see these regulatory agencies consistently expand and expand and expand and take over areas that they were never intended to oversee. An example is that right now the EPA is attempting to set up a sub-agency to oversee ag production in the United States, um, which really what it is intending to do is stop ag production in the United States in the same manner that it is sought to do so for our oil and gas and coal industries. I also find that regulators typically have little practical experience on the ground, and that's a that's a frustration for a practitioner who represents, whether it is gravel pits or oil and gas companies or whatever it might be, 
having to just go out and have them understand hydrology, which can be so important in terms of dealing with these projects. Working on big irrigation facilities and not having them understand the significance of return flows or deep percolation or what that does in terms of keeping our rivers and streams alive in the Western United States. Um, I look at this idea of transition and I think we have to stop using their terminology. And the reason that I say that is because it isn't a transition, it's an addition. We're not going to decrease our energy demand. We're not going to decrease the amount of electricity we need or oil and gas we need or coal we need. It's, it, we're not going to do it unless you want to turn into a third world country. And none of us do. All of us want to keep the prosperity that we have, but we have regulatory agencies that they're trying to push a transition that isn't feasible. So I have an idea of something I'd like Congress to do or try to do it regulatorily. And that is I'd like to do a pilot project. And I'd like to take a city like Boulder, Colorado. They're very green, right? We know about Boulder. How about if we go into Boulder before we do anything else and we take out all their gas stations, we take out all their gas stoves, we take out all of their, anything that is associated with fossil fuels. And I know you smile, but in reality, shouldn't we be doing that before we attempt to impose it on 330 million people? So let's go into Boulder. Let's determine whether it is feasible to have this transition take away all of their their gas uh, fired their their gas vehicles, all of their diesel vehicles, no trucks, no cars other than electric. Uh, take away their gas station and just bring that puppy with with uh, um, with uh, uh, windmills and solar panels. They get a lot of wind there. They get a ton of wind in Boulder, and they've got a lot of sunshine. So let's see if it's feasible to do what people are suggesting we need to do on a national or international level and start with a town of 100,000 people. Let's try that for five years and see how they're doing. They wouldn't last a month. It wouldn't last a month because that isn't the way that our society lives anymore. And I think we really have to be pushing back on this idea that we're going to someday, we're going to have unicorns and rainbows and, and blue skies, and we're not going to need oil and gas and, and all of these other things, because we are. We're never getting away from them. And I will tell you why we know that, because this, this last week in the Epic Times, there was an article entitled, How Climate Change Narrative is Preventing Africa from Modernizing and Gaining Prosperity. We have been, the, our approach to third world countries is cruel and it's sick and it's absolutely unacceptable because we are prohibiting them from accessing the same kind of resources and modern day accoutrements that we have because of this idea of climate change. And we're keeping millions of people in abject poverty because we want to believe that we're doing something good for the world when we're not. We don't want to become this. This isn't where we want to go. We don't want to reverse the advances that we've made in terms of life expectancy and reducing uh, uh, infant mortality rate and all of those things. Yet that's where our regulators are. Our regulators are pushing us towards something that none of us will accept or want to accept. We have to find a way of pushing back against that. Mr. Carter, and we can open this. It can be a discussion too. We don't just have to be Q and A. So well. I'd like to ask um, clarification. Andy, you said something um, that I thought was interesting uh, about EPA regulations, that there couldn't be time constraints, or, or I'm, I'm not sure. So there could be. So we need to have. We need to have. We need to have time constraints. I, I appreciate that because um, on the Energy and Commerce Committee, I also serve on the um, Communications and Technology Subcommittee. And one of the things that we are looking at with um, permitting in, in particularly for broadband and for internet and, and high speed internet and for for making sure we get it out there and, and the deployment of it is having quote unquote shot clocks where you know if if the if a local government or a state government has not made a decision by a certain period of time then you know then it's going to become automatic but but I, I, well, my point on certainty and transparency they go hand in hand you have to have both. Um, one of the issues that I worked on as a, I still not, I don't think it's still fixed, but I started working on it in 1996 with the Army Corps of Engineers. That was just asking the Army Corps a very simple question. How long does it take you to process a 404 permit? And uh, I can tell you today. <laughs> it, it's still not fixed. Yeah. Uh, and it's it comes down to when do they deem the 
when do they start to pop? And, and that was a problem. And I and I put language in the 2000, you know, the 1997 order bill. I put language in the 1999 um, order bill, the 2000 order bill. Each getting a little bit more. When I was a staff director for the safety loop um, highway bill, I put real language in directing the Army Corps to um, calculate how long it took them to process a permit. But they would get a permit application. They would look at it. They would spend days, weeks, months, sometimes years reviewing it asking for more information, more information. They get it and then they say, okay, we have enough information now. This application is complete. We start the clock today. Mm -hmm. And that's just unacceptable. That's why in Virginia, we, we try to get at this by as soon as an application is received, it goes onto the dashboard and that's the transparency part. And then you can see how long it's taking at each step and whether or not for this one that I picked, um, and, and this is a really good, office they usually do a really good job there must be a problem with this particular permit but it's the permit review right now that's gone longer than normal there's other examples where you send it back to the permit team and you ask them to respond within 30 days and sometimes they take 60 90 120 days so it's it's you have to track where the application is and who has their hands on it and that's the transparency part and then the certainty is having a deadline right and just to to your point, to both of your points, I don't know if this is even just pull up, hold the button. Yeah. Hold in. No, nobody's. So first, on your original point, like what EPA is doing, I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens after the Chevron decision occurs, because yeah. that will be an opportunity where I think you guys will end up being extremely busy with a lot of people coming from outside asking for a lot of things to be fixed, um, and that that lends itself to the point of. I love when Congress is explicit in what they say. When I'm in the administration or in the executive branch, I love when I have complete um, opportunities to read the words the way I'd like to read them to get what I'd like done. Um, but when Congress, we, you know, it is your role and it is your duty to write laws, write them explicitly in what you expect and what you would like agencies to do. Um, and, sh and to your point, shine the light on when they are not meeting your expectations. There needs to be notifications if they are not meeting what their statute statutory duty is. Um, but I do think to touch on your dean submitted, that's an issue across all agencies, and I think you'll see it now, even with um, NEPA reform. And congratulations, it's amazing to um, actually touch NEPA legislatively um, after 50 years of everyone saying it couldn't be done. Um, but I do think. When it comes to, I see James Schindler in here, offshore permitting, onshore permitting, NEPA, NOIs, any, anything that they're doing, there's always that interim before it begins where an agency has the ability to say, well, that's not a complete permit. And we'd like to see it complete or X, Y, and Z surveying done by your two, your initial, your initial NOI being published. And that is what, where I think even with direction, we'll start seeing agencies, they already are going in that direction and prescribing what is considered a deemed complete application prior to um, tracking how long two years takes. And it's interesting to see this because two years, for those of you who know NEPA, two years was always in the regulations before Trump was in office. And we came in in the um, Trump administration at Interior and decided, you know what? We think we can do AISs in one year. And um, that was profound, but it happened. And it started getting solidified with a lot of other folks. Maybe there were large appendices um, with some, you know, exceedances and page limits that didn't drop because there were a mix, but um, you started hitting one year EIS as it can be done. So see that codified, it's great. I'd love to see agencies um, focus more on what they can do with those tools faster because it can be done. Thank you. Um, let me just start out. Every time I hear my friend Congressman Connor speak, I, I feel like I have to come back and correct the record. Um, he, he, he said that the state of Georgia was the number one state for investment or business or something like that. And Congressman Hageman and I did a quick little Google search. We found out that the criteria was any state between South Carolina and Florida and and the and the study was done by the University of Georgia. Right? So, <laughs> but um, <laughs> and your point is, um, no, seriously. Um, so so uh, I, I think that 
oftentimes, and 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 both of our our experts or practitioners kind of dug into this a little bit. Oftentimes, what we find ourselves doing, is what we find bureaucrats doing, is is digging in on the process rather than the outcomes. And, and you heard Congressman Hegeman earlier make note that this administration, for example, has has done fewer acres of energy leasing than any administration. Um, and 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 it actually is is even worse than that. Number one, uh, you would have to go back to the Jimmy Carter administration to find anything that's even remotely proximate. And the Jimmy Carter administration issued 100 times more acres of leases than than this administration. Um, and you know, uh, bring back the Jimmy Carter energy policy. No one has said ever. Um, and 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 but it really is remarkable. Like this isn't this isn't a kind of. I mean, this is this is unbelievable. And and the, and the implications that we're going to see are actually five and ten years down the road. Uh, and so this is going to cause huge energy problems years and years from now. Um, and and so I just you know again you have an administration to come in that has regulatory agenda using every single tool they can trying to. Uh, cause death by a thousand, a thousand cuts uh, to an industry that is going to have profound impacts in the United States. And so th that's an outcome that we're going to see moving forward. But number two, um, th this whole climate agenda that this administration is, is, is uh, so aggressively pur pursuing, um, as we've watched this administration carry out their, their, their climate agenda, uh, we're actually seeing worse outcomes, not just on affordability, not just on reliability of energy, but also on emissions. And then emissions are actually going up. There's been a net increase as compared to the previous administration. And and even things that as you over-regulate in this country, um, for every one ton of emissions we've reduced in the United States, China's increased by six. I mean, so think about that from a global perspective. We're actually moving entirely, entirely in the wrong direction. So, so um, a few folks have mentioned, including myself, that, that we have made changes in NEPA, trying to help to change this process, trying to help result in, in better outcomes. And, and, and we did make some massive changes. In fact, we wrote 35 pages of law changes to NEPA, and, and the administration's initial uh, position was that they would not, would not change NEPA, wasn't even a negotiable uh, uh, statute. And, and so we were able to add things like putting in, in law, a two-year timeline on, on uh, EIS as a one-year timeline on EAs. We raised the threshold for the first time ever, um, saying that the first penny in federal funds no longer tri triggers NEPA, that, that you, you actually have a, a higher threshold. We expanded the use of categorical exclusions, including those of sister agencies. Um, we, we ensure that NEPA now will only look at reasonably foreseeable impacts, not all of these other imaginary impacts that, that have been studied uh, for years, therefore just focusing more so on the environment. But something, and, and let me just quickly make note that, uh, that the administration, the 489 pages of rules have done everything they can to wiggle out of these things. Um, uh, trying to say on the two-year, one-year shot clocks that the clock doesn't start until scenarios like you both have, have laid out. Um, trying to weave in environmental justice, which I still am not exactly sure what that what that is. Um, that the, the definitions have been so vague, and it's like it allows for whatever interpretation you want in order to achieve the outcome that you have. Um, and, and I expect that you're going to see much litigation because I think they've gone way beyond uh, what what was actually allowed for in the law. But but let me let me just say this again as I started, not hazing Georgia, but as I started with. We've got to focus on outcomes. And, and one of the things that I think is most remarkable about the regulatory process is that you have heard over and over again, often from, from friends on the on the other side of the aisle, about how if we do this, if we don't do this, it's going to cause all of these massive environmental impacts. And as these folks will both tell you, the truth is this. The truth is that the majority of projects carried out across America today are actually carried out without complying with NEPA. In fact, NEPA doesn't even apply because the majority of projects carried out across the country today are using private dollars or local or state dollars and does not trigger a NEPA threshold, which of course is federal money, federal resources, or federal regulatory. 
permitting. And if it's kind to Louisiana and it's not uh, pro Georgia, that's fine. No, I just want to make the point that that's intentional on their part. I, I know many municipalities and county governments that right. will yeah. intentionally bypass the federal process because it takes so long. Yeah, and and so two last things. Uh, one is is uh, Administrator Wheeler laid out in the whole transparency thing uh, in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. There is a requirement uh, uh, that that we do, do move toward an even NEPA type process, which I think just that sunshine that you talked about is such a powerful force and uh, will will help to get things moving faster. Uh, and then lastly, one of the things that I think we need to do, and I know that, that both of my, my colleagues here, especially Congressman Hegman, who I serve on the Natural Resources Committee with, um, is, is strongly supportive. But but what one of the things I need to do, I think that we need to do, and not just if Chevron uh, lands in our favor, is I think that we need to begin as Congress looking at doing a better job yes. protecting congressional intent by being more specific, including including establishing <clears throat> establishing limits on regulatory budgets. When we give an agency authority, we need to put a dollar figure in there that says nothing under this act shall exceed and make up a number. Uh, no, I mean not make it up in the legislation, but I'm going to make up a number. Uh, $10,000 in regulatory compliance costs. And then something we don't ever, ever do is we've got to do an after action analysis to determine how much did it actually cost to comply with that regulation? Because, because we'll have agencies that come in and lowball how much uh, regulatory compliance is going to be with the intention of trying to avoid an OIRA analysis uh, in OMB uh, because they know that that requires more scrutiny. And we have got, we have got to preserve congressional intent with regulatory budgets and also do after actions that actually assess how much did it actually cost to comply and, and how far off was Department of Interior in their estimate on well control rule, for example. So done. Can I intervene? Because I did just fact check you a little bit. And Florida is actually in the top two are one of the highest GDP growth states. And I just want to plug that in. And from a permitting perspective, um, Congresswoman, I think I know how we feel about solar, but it is pretty important in my state, and not that we would ever tell other states how to generate their own power. But for us, you know, in the state of Florida, especially from the FPL standpoint, solar is important to us as well as. And our big picture items are nuclear and natural gas. And I think we're the largest consumer of natural gas in the nation when it comes to uh, electrical generation. And even in the state of Florida, you know, just to step aside and leave it for a quick second, I think I should just probably bring up on the panel the Endangered Species Act because that's a really fun one, um, which is another one where we are lacking some certainty in implementation, not just regulations, but the statute itself is true meaning and true reading has turned into at some times with the rats. And yeah. in, in many ways, um, certain sometimes their hands are tied on what the actual statute allows them to do when a species is either listed or is threatened or uplisted to endangered. And that's another one that, you know, I just wanted to briefly touch on because I know that's the jurisdiction was committee, that there's been a lot of work done looking at that statute in case you we need a next project, but um, but in the state of Florida, whether you're building renewables or you're or you're trying to maintain the operations of your nuclear facility or you know good clean power to your ratepayers, or you're trying to move natural gas to your combined cycle maintenance, the Endangered Species Act is going to have an impact, and it's every state. It's not just Florida, and that's another one um, that I just wanted to call a little attention to because again, implementation. Um, at the federal, federal level, absolutely matters. And deregulatory actions that were taken in our administration and were painstakingly over four years, multiple deregulatory actions um, that have since been, been revised or reformed, uh, you know, have and could have made a difference. And I know that's one area that you're focusing on, but NEPA aside, I think there's a lot of folks who also are trying to construct projects, even if they're avoiding federal land. Even if they're avoiding a federal nexus, um, maybe sometimes they won't because they want to be under Section 7 versus Section 10 and have the uncertainty of trying to figure out if they need to have that conservation plan, which in some cases have taken longer than 20 years. Just so I need that. Can I jump in for, for just a second? I, I agree with Kate that solar is, is important. Um, and, but what really... Uh, 
frustrates me is that the NEPA proposal from the administration, where they're singling out renewables as having um, less of an environmental impact, but, and they want to they want NEPA reforms to apply to renewables, but not to everything else. There are positive and negative impacts for every single energy source, and they are skirting over and ignoring the negative impacts of some preferred energy sources and, and really focusing on negative impacts of others. If you really, if, if NEPA is important, environmental review is important, then we need to do it at the same level for all projects. I mean, there are negative impacts on from solar, large scale solar farms as far as water runoff. We've seen that in the Chesapeake Bay area with you know, the water runoff issues around solar panels. That should be looked at just the same as water issues for coal fired power plants or natural gas fired power plants or, or nuclear plants. But everything should be treated equally and the same. You shouldn't have preferred industries. Um, you shouldn't have the same process. This goes back to transparency and, and certainty. So um, we are doing some, uh, making some effort at fundamental ESA reform within natural resources. And I agree with you, that is a, that's a statutory framework that can have enormous implications. And again, especially in a state like Wyoming, where 50% of our surface estate is owned by the feds and 65% of our mineral estate. Uh, when we were having a hearing on my bill to delist the greater Yellowstone ecosystem grizzly bears, Eventually, what I figured out after spending quite some time debating the Democrats on this was that they had never read the Endangered Species Act. And I finally pointed that out during the hearing because they didn't, I had the, the recovery plan in front of me. I had the the, the various plans from, the, from the, the Fish and Wildlife Service and they kept throwing these amendments out there. And well, you had to do, you had to consult with the tribes. Well, that's that's baked in the cake. That's, that's already part of it. Well, you have to do this. Well, that's already part of it. And finally, I stopped and I looked at him and I said, none of you have ever read the Endangered Species Act, have you? And they were totally silent. And so that when you talk about the certainty that we need to provide as legislators, I refer to not providing that as legislative malpractice. And again, being a practitioner who's practiced in this area for as long as I have, that legislative malpractice is extremely difficult when you're going in and trying a case in federal court. It's the Clean Water Act, it's NEPA, it's the Clean Air Act, it's the ASA, it's all of these compounding statutes that have now been used to basically try to stymie everything that, that we need to do to provide affordable energy and food and, 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 and those kinds of things. Um, as far as these, what these agencies are also doing, I also found that they have found mechanisms of self-funding. And by that, they are doing that through NEPA, where they come in and you want to build a pipeline and you go to the whatever will be the, the lead agency and you sit down across from them and you talk about what you're going to do and they push a paper across the table and say, well, you need to sign this first. And well, what is it I need to sign? You need to sign that you're going to fund the entire, uh, the, the entire uh, NEPA analysis, the entire EIS. My first reaction was, it, well, as a conservative, I, I can see that my client, my project component, maybe should pay for that. But then you start thinking about how that plays out in terms of how these, these, these programs then move forward or these projects move forward. So that's something else that I don't think that Congress has an entire handle on is to what extent these agencies are actually self-funding through their permitting requirements, through their um, the, the lead agency stuff, through the NEPA analysis, through the ESA stuff, and actually growing and growing and growing and gathering more power, but also becoming very independent from us because not all of their appropriations come from us. So it becomes much easier to say, I don't have to do what Congress says. I'll just go get this guy over here to pay for uh, yet another office in Denver, Colorado. And so that was something that I've discovered is the self-funding. Grand junction. I would just say too, uh, to your point on reading the statutes, and I think that's why, you know, I kind of found them like that on the shelf like that first, but um, reading that over recess, but um, working for Secretary David Burke, um, all of us, one of the best lessons for all of us was, well, did you read it? Did you read the EIS? Did you spend your time reading those 350 pages? Are you prepared for this meeting? And it was, um, 
an amazing experience to watch someone read some of this stuff, especially those who are not used to NEPA saying, yeah. wait, we're going to have to do what or what and how and where and and what is the impact on the local level when you say that you're not be able to have any grazing in a specific area when there's been grazing lot that's there for 100 years, you know? So I think um, it's really important. It's a good shout out for any staff member too, is read your statutes, leave us seven pages. ESA is charged. You know, exactly. Oh, and robust, uh, insightful conversation. Thank you all for joining us. I'll take three takeaways here. Certainty transparency and read it yes. so, with that thank you all we'll continue this conversation in future uh, dc connects appreciate it bye